If you love the Adventure Sports Podcast, I'm confident that you're going to love Armchair Explorer. It's a new podcast by a recent guest, Aaron Miller, who is an award-winning London Times and National Geographic travel writer who basically sits down with some of the world's biggest explorers and adventurers and lets them tell their favorite story of all time. We're talking Olympic gold medalists who backcountry ski in Alaska to award-winning travel riders who walk across Antarctica in the footsteps of Shackleton, gorilla trekking with leading conservationists, great white shark diving with some of the best in the industry, as well as interviewing astronauts about spacewalking above Earth. It's honestly a condensed version of our show, taking the best of the best stories and letting those explorers tell them. If you're interested to hear more, I highly encourage you to check out armchair-explorer.com or just looking up Armchair Explorer anywhere you find podcasts. And let it inspire you to get out there and do something fun and do something epic. ASP listeners, you can get 50% off your first order of CS Instant Coffee by using the code ADVENTURE. Check them out. They've been a supporter of the show for a while, so it would really mean a lot if you went and supported them. Thank you. I I guess the main thing is just to be constantly aware and just checking in on people. So to kind of let them do their own thing, but also knowing that you are there to take over if need be. The waves and the wind picks up, you know, I'm here and I can clip on a rope and I can tow you, but I'm not going to until you either ask me or it's an emergency. This is the Adventure Sports Podcast, where we hear stories of adventure from every corner of the planet. We interview all sorts of folks who are using their sport to explore the world around them and give you the inspiration you need to get out there and have some fun. Hey folks, Mason here. I hope you had a good weekend, by the way. And I just wanted to say, you know, I know there's been a lot of ads on the show lately, um, you know, in the middle of the show, which are called mid-rolls and also a lot of pre-rolls. You just heard Armchair Explorer, a new podcast by Aaron Miller. Totally check it out. It's awesome. I've I've been loving it. You know, these ads help us essentially pay for the show. If you don't know, you know, I do this on the side. I work full time. This is, I do this on nights and weekends and it takes a lot of time from family and friends. And so I love producing it. Don't get me wrong, but anytime we have an advertiser or a sponsor of the show, I really do take advantage of it because it it helps justify this time that I have to unfortunately spend away from family or away from adventure and away from the outdoors. It's a lot of time in front of a screen. So I appreciate your patience and just giving us the ability to take advantage of the these opportunities and uh, we love working with them and it really helps fuel this show and I also want to thank our patrons we have a lot of patrons that support the show and um, they give around five bucks a month each and it's been just a huge blessing to know that there are folks that believe that much into what we're doing and going into today's episode you know you know this is in a way, doing the outdoors for a living, you know what I mean? You know, talking about stories and adventure. And so I love talking to other people who are doing that in a unique way. And something that a lot of folks always dream about doing is adventure guiding. And Chris Whitaker has figured out a pretty cool formula of, you know, swapping seasons, you know, winter stuff and summer stuff and fitting in personal adventures in between. So I thought it'd be just an awesome experience to talk about, you know, how he's figured that out, what it looked like early on and what you can also do to do that. And just, you know, to throw a carrot out there for a couple of weeks from now, we're going to hear, you know, we're hearing the positive side of adventure guiding here. We're going to also hear the other side of adventure guiding uh, in a couple of weeks. So that's going to be, you know, maybe someone who pursued it and it didn't go quite as to plan so just be listening for that but chris is uh chris was awesome to talk to and he also has some personal adventures coming up one is called for fun's sake which is a uh, kayaking tour up the inside passage as well as launching his own guiding company i encourage you to check all that out he talks about it more at the end of the episode uh, and it's also information in the show notes but anyway Uh, Thank you so much for listening again, and I hope this show is everything you're needing for inspiration on a Monday morning. Yeah, get out there and have some fun.
All right, folks, welcome to the show. Uh, today we're talking to Chris Whitaker. He's really just kind of your all-around adventure. I've seen a bunch of pictures of him in all different sorts of settings, so I'm interested to hear some of the stories behind these pictures. Uh, Chris, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you very much. Cheers for having me on. Yeah, where are you coming from today? Uh, so right now I'm in Whistler, which is BC and Canada, for those folks that don't know. Beautiful area. Yeah, pretty amazing. Um, just being surrounded by by the mountains. Um, yeah, it's a, a pretty incredible place to be for the winter. Yeah, so so are you there the entire winter? Yeah, so I got here in mid-December, and I'll stay here until May. And I was here last winter as well. Um, I currently work full-time as a snowboard instructor, uh, amongst some other things, freelance at the same time. But yeah, mostly snowboarding all the time. Oh, man, that's incredible. See, I... I'd... I didn't even know that. I, you know, I, I'd love to hear more about you. You know, the research I've done on you is mostly from your website, which is globalshenanigans.com. It's global-shenanigans.com. Uh, can you just kind of go into, you know, wh- where you grew up, what were kind of some of your early adventure experiences, and what kind of gave you this passion for doing everything you've done? Um, so I'm from the UK, um, from the countryside about one hour north of London, and I didn't really get into adventure sports, well, I didn't at all until I finished school. So when I was about 18, I I knew I wanted to travel, but I didn't really know much more than that. I didn't know what to do at university or what I wanted to study and to then do as a career. So I googled how to travel and get paid, and that <laughs> that led me to... Uh, kayaking as a thing like you know like becoming a kayak instructor and at the time I'd never really done any kayaking but I signed si- signed up for a uh, a 12-week kayak instructor course that involved climbing and hiking and some other things as well just to get like entry-level qualifications and start working so I I started in the summer activity season for like multi-activity centers doing a little bit of everything just for mostly school students on adventure programs and then after a couple of years of that, I started to work abroad. I worked in France, uh, then a season in China and all over the place, really. And it kind of just snowballed into all these different activities and adventure sports and just a lot of crazy opportunities seemed to keep popping up. And I realized that, you know, this is this is the industry for me and this is a, a genuine career you can do, like stay within the outdoors for your whole life if you want to. So yeah, I kind of stumbled upon it and then found all these activities uh, through the the urge to try and travel and see new places. Wow. So, so I, I guess I'd love to go in that direction with this episode, just talking about, you know, doing all these different sorts of jobs and kind of a career of adventure travel, because, you know, it seems like you, you, you Googled that, but now you're emulating it. Um, you know, getting paid to travel, you know, what kind, what is it, what did it start to mold into for you? Is it like taking a gig here, taking a gig there? Is it seasonal stuff? And so the, the kayaking, you did that for a while, I assume, but you know, apparently that didn't scratch the itch enough and you wanted to move on to other sports and other things. Yeah. So it's mostly been, uh, well, to begin with seasonal employment. So to begin with summer seasons, and then I would try and you know, save up a little bit, maybe work at a bar and then travel in the winter. And then I realized that I can't just work for half of the year in the industry. So I, I, I got into snowboard instructing as well to kind of balance that out to get mostly year long employment. And, um, I guess from doing that for a couple of seasons, I kind of realized I was in quite a fortunate position that I'm getting into some pretty adventurous situations and doing some really cool things that most people have no idea about you know like not that many people know people within the industry and I I sure didn't when I got into it I just sort of got myself in so I I thought I should probably take advantage of the situation of you know being in these such interesting environments so I started to try and uh, photograph it and document it and you know do a little bit of travel writing at the same time just for fun to begin with, just to kind of share some stories for my friends and my family because, you know, they just hear little snippets and tell me how amazing it sounded. So I thought I'd write some stuff down. And then that stuff has also kind of snowballed and I started to get more writing work and photography work. 
uh, going on assignments for people, being flown to different places here and there. So it's it's kind of led into a whole separate job within the same industry that I can then do around my full time work, either kayaking or snowboarding. And then as I travel as well to try and pick up little bits here and there just to sort of supplement my travel and just keep me going and doing all these cool things. Yeah, man, I'm going through your Instagram right now as you talk and it's just the pictures are incredible. So you obviously <laughs> have, you know, photography skills, but I'm sure that took time to develop and you probably didn't even foresee that as being a way to make money. Um, at this until getting better at it. I am, and I might be wrong, but as well as writing it. So, you know, what would you say has been one of the biggest skills you've had the best skills on kind of turning all these new, uh, new passions and new ideas into a way to, to keep yourself out there longer through making a little bit of money at it? Yeah, that's a good question. Cause I never really started the photography as a way to make money initially. Uh, the reason was because i I kept taking photos on my phone and, you know, honestly, they just stuck at the time. Like the phone cameras weren't that good. So <laughs> Is it like old flip phone or something? <laughs> well, you go to all these cool places, you know, there's no depth of the mountains or the valley or whatever, you know, it doesn't even come close to how incredible it was. So I thought I should really just buy a half decent camera. Like I got a pretty good deal on eBay and I still have the same camera um, from like five, four or five years ago, the same like cheap eBay camera. Um, and I, I just started taking it everywhere because it was fairly cheap and a really sweet deal. I didn't actually mind so much about, you know, being precious about it. I didn't care if it was in my backpack or if it got rained on or if I took it out while I'm kayaking. So I think a big thing for me was just always having it on hand and just being, you know, immersed in that world of just trying to take photos all the time because they're the best photos, the ones you don't plan, you know, like a, some wildlife might pop up or something cool would happen with the light. So just always having things ready and just being prepared to like jump on any opportunity, really. That's probably been the most helpful thing. So with, with that attitude, I also read that you, uh, you took a, a vow sort of, of being, being a yes man, saying yes to opportunities. Um, how, how many dead ends do you think that that attitude has led you to, to where you had to re-navigate or ha has it just been kind of this continuous flow of a river from one opportunity to the next. I mean, has it been like a, a challenge or more of a natural flow for you? It's, it's probably been more of a natural flow. Like I didn't intentionally, you know, to sit there and be like, I'm going to say yes to everything that happens. It's more that it was just kind of happening anyway. Like I was starting to notice, you know, people would come with sometimes quite last minute opportunities, you know, like, I don't know. Someone's dropped out. I need you to do this like within a week. And I guess my initial response is just, yes, I can definitely do that. And then you start to figure out, can you do it afterwards? And then more often than not, it all works out. So it, it's more just like, I don't know, being open to these opportunities. And then I think that's in hand led to more. I guess once you start to become known as someone that is going to, you know, be solution focused, find the answers and just, you know, get it done that it ends up leading to a lot of other things. So, you know, some of my most random trips away for various different companies are through people that I've met through, you know, other trips away where I've just said yes to a last minute opportunity. And it's just spawned into so much more than that. Yeah, man, no kidding. I, I you know, I, as I continue to scroll, I, I see you like on stage as a DJ. I see you on kayaks on around <laughs> islands. I see you in a bathtub full of money. Uh, I, I mean, I'm seeing lit, like volcanoes. Like, what the heck is your life? How? What? Like, what is the? It just seems like the most random places. But obviously, uh, it's, it's crazy. It's all Instagram, man. None, yeah. none of it's real. It's all this Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, nah, man. I have. I gotta find that hard to believe. Like, like what? So, you, so you did the kayaking. You jumping back and forth. Could could you just kind of basic overview of what kind of jobs you've done and the places you've been, just and in, in what it's starting to look like now? I know that might be a, a pretty big question. Yeah, but yeah, yeah um, go for it. I'll I'll quickly explain that money bar photo because um, <laughs> yeah. it, this is it. It's not exactly as it seems. Um, I'm not like a an Instagram millionaire or anything. Um, that was the well. You, you may have seen there's a series of them. 
the first one was because uh, I was trip leading for a company in China, uh, working with international school students going on like five to 10 day adventure programs. Um, and I was in charge of that particular trip. And we had, I don't know, like 90 students who were staying in a, a four star hotel for a week. So obviously there's quite a lot of money to pay. All right. And the trip I'd led previously was fairly remote. And I was in a very awkward situation where I didn't have enough cash to pay for the hotel and the nearest ATM was like 30 minutes away. So I couldn't pay the manager. Luckily, the taxi driver taking us afterwards was friends with him. So he trusted me. Like I just I left with the taxi driver, paid the taxi driver, and he took the money back to him. But it was really bad business, you know, like you shouldn't do that kind of stuff, particularly in Asia where they're so like, I don't know, they have a lot of business customs. So I thought on my next trip, I'm just going to get out all the cash that I need and just have it with me, and then I never have to do that again. And in the photo, it looks like loads of money. It, it is quite a lot. It's about like 2,000 or 3,000 pounds, which I guess would be like, I don't know, nearly 4,000 US. But because it's in Chinese currency, it's a lot more notes. So it looks uh, looks pretty impressive. And I thought, <laughs> when else would I have so much cash just with me? So I, I jumped in the bath and got my mate to take a quick photo for me. Let's take a quick break and hear from our sponsor, Roman. One of the things I hate the most about doctor's appointments is that I will schedule one and it's literally probably a month later before I can go. And then it's a lot of time before I get results. And honestly, you know, being a guy, I don't go to the doctor all that often. I think, oh my gosh, I think it's been years, literally years since I've been to the dentist or the doctor. And I definitely have some issues I need to seek treatment on. I just, I don't know. I did procrastinate in that department. And if you're dealing with something like erectile dysfunction, that procrastination is not going to pay off in the long run. Let's just put it that way. Good news is Roman has been spending years trying to solve this by building a digital platform that connects you with a doctor who's licensed in your state, all from the comfort of your home. So they make it convenient to get a treatment you need and on your schedule. So just grab your phone and really all you have to do is use your phone or computer and you complete a free online visit and you'll hear back from a U.S. licensed physician within 24 hours. And if doctor decides that treatment is right for you, Roman's Pharmacy can ship your medication to you free in just two days. So you don't even need to leave your house on one hand is great because I I love to work. I'm a workaholic, so I want to work. I don't want to take time out of my day to go to the doctor, take care of myself. I kind of just want it shipped to me. You know, we're in this Amazon culture and it's awesome to get stuff sent to us. And Roman has figured that out when it comes to dealing with erectile dysfunction. And obviously there's no commitments. You can cancel any time. So if you're struggling with ED, go to getroman.com slash ASP for a free online visit and free two-day shipping. That's getroman.com slash ASP. A S P for a free online visit and free two day shipping. And that is also in the show notes. All right. Thank you. And let's get back to the episode. And, and pour you a, a glass of champagne <laughs> or wine, whatever it is. Oh, that, that was actually the repeat like a year or two later uh, oh, okay. in Vietnam. I thought, Hey, this is a nice hotel. Let's do the same thing. So you have but a you have a habit of doing this. <laughs> it, it's become a bit of a running joke. So who knows where the next one will be? Not here in Canada. Everything's quite expensive here. I don't right. have that much money. Right. Maybe uh maybe somewhere else. But um but yeah, that that was working in China for an outdoor education provider, so summer season gig. But since then, I've kind of specialized more in uh, sea kayaking, um, multi day expeditions. I just found for me personally. Sea kayaking was the most fun of all the activities I was leading because everything that your group is doing, you are also doing as the leader. So however much fun you have, that passes on to the rest of the group. You know, it's not like if you're rock climbing, you basically climb up, you put the rope there or your group climb all day and then you take the rope back again. So uh, I didn't find that quite as enjoyable, but sea kayaking you know, it's great. You're just doing like nature tours, wilderness tours, whatever, uh, just kayaking about on the water all day. And so, yeah, I kind of moved more into that for the, for the summer guiding work. And where is that? Uh, the last two summers has been in BC, um, off of Quadra Island. It's where all the, 
well, not all, but a lot of marine mammals seem to hang out. So there's a lot of uh, humpback whales, dolphins, killer whales, and all sorts. So that's like wildlife tours. Um, but I've worked in a few few different places. Um, I, I worked in Sicily for a season. That's where the volcano photos are from. That's basically doing like volcano tours. There's two active ones around that uh, that spot I was at. And um, yeah, just trying to move around as much as possible, really. Like I said, travel was the initial incentive to get into this line of work in the outdoors. So I've just been trying to move around as much as I can. Do, do you find taking the seasonal work, um, does, does it, I'm sure it does at times, but overall, is it a challenge to, to kind of have to be responsible for people and enjoy being out there? Or is that something you enjoy doing, showing people, probably a lot of them for the first time, these, these amazing places? I really enjoy it. Yeah, I think it's really fun to pass on you know, something that I think is such an incredible experience, particularly if it's someone's first ever time. We get a lot of adults and it's their first time ever camping. They, they've they lived in a city their whole life and then their whole career. And, you know, there's a, a growing industry of sort of ethical and responsible travel as a, a form of holiday or vacation. So I think more and more people are going to start to take those types of trips away in their time off and you know, sort of value time outdoors and in nature more. So it's really cool to show people that first experience. Do, do you have any particular story that might emulate, you know, somebody who who maybe thought they couldn't do it or, or someone you were able to help experience something they, you know, an adventure of a lifetime? Yeah, so the, the summer work in particular, the, the main selling point of these trips is for people to see killer whales and people absolutely love killer whales. It turns out people are completely obsessed. Uh, some people have <laughs> killer whale tattoos. They have like killer whale profile photos on Facebook, like their phone background. It's like everything. So these people are mad for it. And they've never seen one before other than on movies. So, you know, really they're only there to see this animal. The fact that we're kayaking and camping, that's just like a bonus. But they're often like quite nervous about that side of it. So just sort of showing people how that is also fun, like to be in the kayak is like such the, a better way of viewing these animals rather than, you know, with an engine, you're nice and quiet, you're in their territory, you're not making any noise, you're just kind of floating there. And then the animals sometimes literally come to you, which is really cool. So yeah, we get a lot of people like as nervous to see the wildlife as they are to be in the boat or to be camping because they've just never done it before. Wow, man, that's, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I grew up kayaking. I absolutely love it. And I think I'm, I'm getting more back into it now. And I've always wanted to do the inside passage. And I know that, uh, where you, you do your experiences are, is, is, you know, kind of like right along there, the beautiful, beautiful British Columbia coast. And, um, I'm sure people are just, I mean, that's a, that's a wild place, man. First of all, it's really desolate. Secondly, there's all kinds of creatures. I mean, you got the whales in the water and you got grizzlies in the land. It's it's a really adventurous place. So it does take a lot of guts to to even get out there for most folks. Yeah, that's true. It's a really wild place. Um, when I first got out to Canada, I was a little bit nervous about the wildlife that was here because, you know, people tell you, like, yeah, there's bears around, there's wolves around, there's whatever. And as someone coming from England where there's like no wildlife that's going to cause you any harm whatsoever to be surrounded by real wildlife, basically like actual, you know, big animals, um, is a little bit daunting at first, but then, you know, you get more comfortable. You realize there's, um, practices you can put in place, you know, backcountry etiquette, bear country stuff. And, uh, yeah, you start to really, you know, want to see those animals, particularly in the kayak. If you see a bear on land, it's like the the best experience because they, they're they not really bothered by you if you're nice and quiet. So, you know, you get people freak out a little bit when you first see one. But once you calm everyone down, tell everyone to just listen. Um, yeah, the bears just do their own thing. They flip rocks. They try and get the, the crabs and the shellfish that's washed up or whatever. So they're not really... Um, they're not out to get us is what I've realized. It's usually human error that leads to that. 
Absolutely. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's, you know, 99% of the time it's people not doing what they're supposed to or not being where they're supposed to be. And, and, uh, yeah. So they, you know, once you get over that, it, I'm, I'm sure it's, you know, you don't even hardly even recognize, you know, notice them anymore, <laughs> uh, as a threat, especially. So, you know, you, you, you've, it seems like you've kind of figured out, or at least you're in this place where you, you've got a nice summer gig and a nice winter gig, your snowboard, uh, your snowboard teacher, right up in Whistler right now, instructor, yep. I'm sorry, snowboard instructor. Um, you know, do, do you enjoy having those two things now set in place to kind of go back and forth? Or are you always looking for something new and different to do? Uh, you know, like, where are you with that? I, I really enjoy doing the two opposite seasons. For me, towards the end of winter, I'm just really looking forward to being in some warm weather and in a boat again. And then vice versa for the summer, you know, I start to dream about snowboarding a little bit more towards the end of the season and I'm just ready to do something else. So it's really nice doing both of them for me. And, you know, I, I find one advantage for me with my photography and writing stuff is that I'm not really getting into it to try and escape a career or anything. Like I already love what I'm doing. I'm just trying to add to it and do even more stuff and try and get more remote and push things a little bit further. So I'm not trying to leave the guiding and instructing industry because it's just so much fun and there's so many places it can take you to. Um, so yeah, I, I really enjoy the setup of doing, of doing both of them. I don't know if I'll do just the same teaching and guiding forever. I'd like to eventually move. Um, and is actually something I'm planning this year to start running my own trips and my own expeditions to different parts of the world to just take some people who maybe don't have the time or the knowledge or they're just too busy with their own lives to put in the effort of finding out how can I go to a certain place and do this trip. So I'm going to try and see if I can organize some of those myself and try and get some other people to join me on some of these more adventure sports and adventure travel trips for a couple weeks at a time. Oh man, that sounds awesome. Yeah. With all your places you've been and the experience you have and knowing how to deal with, you know, customers essentially and, and people you're guiding, that sounds fantastic. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, I've did a little bit of guiding back in the day and I, I always found a hard time knowing kind of what parts of the adventure to hold their hand, hold customers' hands with, um, and also like what to give them empowerment to do. You know what I'm saying? I like I, I it, like taking people on adventure and into the wilderness, they gotta have some some gusto themselves, you know what I mean? It's not like you're signing up for a for a safari ride in a Humvee or something or a Jeep. Like you're gonna be hiking, you're gonna be climbing, you're gonna be kayaking. What, what do, how, how do you balance those two things, holding their hand and leading them as well as empowering them to do it on their own? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And I feel for every individual, it's going to be slightly different as everyone has their own sort of level or their own, own bar to set. And it's kind of just a, a day by day or even an hour by hour situational thing. Um, I, I guess the main thing is just to be constantly aware and just checking in on people so to kind of let them do their own thing but also knowing that you are there to take over if need be you know like if the waves and the wind picks up you know I'm here and I can clip on a rope and I can tow you if we need to but I'm not going to until you either ask me or it's an emergency you know and just reminding them like right now it's not an emergency you're fine keep going do this do that and it will be okay you know like if you're taking shelter because there's a lightning storm, just kind of checking in with everyone, making sure everyone's comfortable. They know we're safe and it's all good and keeping everyone happy. And then I feel that actually adds to more of the experience. You know, it's more of an adventure because they've gone through that hardship. It's not just, you know, sunshine and rainbows the whole time. So it's just trying to find that balance, which yeah, different for everybody. You never really know how someone's going to react. Do you have any stories about people just not being ready for an adventure? There's people that have, um, yeah, maybe their expectations are a little off. They might sort of forget that the weather changes. You might have only seen the best photos on the website and just checked the weather for that <laughs> right. before and it was like really right. sunny and you expect that to happen. So 
yeah, people being unprepared in terms of like what gear they bring. And then, you know, particularly here in BC, they forget that it's a temperate rainforest. So it, it rains that much that it's a rainforest. So the chances of it being sunny your whole trip are pretty slim. Uh, and people forget that quite often, but it can always be managed. And these are a few rare cases, but yeah, most of the time people are pretty good. Like these trips are fairly self, um, self filtering, you know, people don't book on these trips if they don't want some kind of challenge. So just trying to figure that out early on and know who's more up for it and who's not. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Man, I ask all that because, because I used to do uh, self-guided trips. So I'd give you the plan and you did it yourself. Well, I remember having a customer one time that, that, you know, had all their gear, had a, you know, all their equipment, you know, everything they needed for a backpacking experience. And they called you know, us, my friend and I ran a company and they were like, you know, where are you guys? <laughs> and I was like, dude, this is self-guided. Like we're not good. We're, I'm a thousand miles away from you. <laughs> There's no way I can be there to guide you. That's what the, the I mean, it's, that's the name of the adventure is self-guided backpacking. And so, you know, that's, that was a horror story on my end, but I, I didn't know if you, you have to deal with stuff like that on a pretty regular basis, being with them the whole time during the adventure. But. That's a, a real winner of a business model you have there where you don't actually need to be there to do any of the guiding. That's great. Yeah, it's really it was really hard to pull off. <laughs> <laughs> it it definitely I will say this. Uh I did it for a while. I honestly wanted I hated not going. You know what I mean? It's cool sending all you know, you can obviously scale it because you can send a lot more people out at once, you know, just with the same plan on the same trails and just they're kind of a day or so behind each other. And so you can, you know, it's more efficient that way, but you also don't get to experience it yourself and you don't get to experience those life changing moments for people. And that to me is, I don't know, it's honestly more important, you know? Yeah, I get that. I find the same issue a lot of people that move up the levels of management with outdoor companies that the further up you get, the further removed from the outdoors you are. And it sort of takes away of the whole reason you got into it in the first place. Absolutely. That is so true. Now, has that at all happened with you? Um, I know you're still there guiding, but could, could, could you foresee that? Cause I know I did a handful of, of all, you know, in, in person guiding and some of them were just, it was just hard, man. It was just like, gosh, this group is not, cool they do not want to they are not enjoying this like they thought they would um yeah it, it it kind of started to happen a bit in um in china i was there and started to get well i took one promotion one year and it was great i actually had more responsibility more to do um and could actually go on to further tours but then i was offered another level up and yeah i i foresaw that exact problem and i i realized that you know what i'm not actually ready to 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 do that, to take those kind of level jobs just yet, because I'm too, uh, I'm too much wanting to be involved on the the field level. Um, so yeah, that's why I've just kind of stuck with the guiding for now. Um, but we did have that more often in uh, those places where I've worked with school students. I feel like that's when you get people that are maybe a little bit harder to manage or deal with because they're not necessarily there by their own choice. It could be their school or their parents or whatever program they're signed up in has made them do a five-day hike. They don't really want to do it. Adults is different. They've paid a lot of money to be there, so most of them are going to do their best to enjoy it. But, yeah, the, the school students can sometimes be a little bit harder to manage and to deal with. And, you know, they have a lot more to learn as well. So that's when it's even more important that they have to just tough it out and um, get the most out of those trips. Time for a quick message break. CS Instant Coffee is definitely the best instant coffee I've ever had. In fact, just out of convenience and how good it tastes, I decided for the last year I've been taking it on every single adventure I go on from backpacking to bike tours. Uh, just from convenience sake, it's really high quality and it keeps me from having to take a bunch of other equipment out in the woods. Uh, but it's not just for going out on adventures. My wife actually takes some to work Every single day with her, she takes a couple packs uh, to refill her coffee mug uh, as a teacher. She doesn't have a ton of time to um, have to you know, make fresh 
coffee all the time. So she just needs a little hot water, can pour the coffee in, and she's ready to go for her next class and not waste a lot of time. So if you're crunched for time in your job, uh, I would definitely suggest giving it a shot because they have been huge supporters of the show for the last year, and I really appreciate everything they've done for us, and it would mean a lot to me to go support them. So if you're interested, go to csinstant.coffee and uh, support those who are supporting the show. It would go a long way. Thank you. All right, let's get back to the episode. God, dude, that is that is the truest thing I've ever heard. I yeah, I hate to keep mentioning like, but I I know exactly what you're talking about. It was the high school and co- you know school groups that were so difficult. I remember we were doing a you know like a hike one time with this group in this beautiful place, and I was talking to one of the kids, and he was you know they they were a really tough group. This was one of the good kids, and and he was like, yeah. I'm excited to get back home because my family were we're going to sail the Mediterranean for three months on this. I'm I'm sorry, boated on this yacht that my dad owns or is renting, and it's fully staffed. and And I was like, "Wow, this 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 trip is trash compared to what you're about to do. Like, <laughs> you don't want to be here. Half these kids don't want to be here, and that's they. Uh, it's no fun babysitting out there, but." Um, you know, I, I assume all your family's still back in the UK. What do they think about what you do and, your, and the lifestyle you've chosen? They're very supportive. Yeah, they they really are happy that I've kind of par- uh, carved this path for myself, and I've sort of stumbled upon some really cool opportunities. And yeah, they know it sort of fits me really well now. It was never a the plan from the offset, or it wasn't such a clear plan. I've kind of figured it out as I've gone along and sort of winged it here and there but they know how much I'm enjoying it and how much it suits me now and yeah they they think it's just great that's so cool man and I assume you probably get back to see them every once in a while um not not so much recently <laughs> uh they've I feel my parents have now realized that uh they're better off coming to visit me wherever I am uh, my brother, he, my brother doesn't live at home. He, he lives in the Philippines, so he's just as far away, but on the other side of the world. So recently they've found that it would be better if they were to leave the UK and come and find us in some remote place. And we'll, we'll have more of a family holiday somewhere that's not the UK. That seems to work better for everybody, I think. I, I'm sure they don't mind getting away to some of these beautiful locations you get to you get to spend your time. So yeah, it makes a ton it of sense. It's a good excuse. Yeah, it good is. Get out. Yeah, we gotta go see. You gotta go see Chris. He just so happens to be in in Bali. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not so into the uh, adventure sports though. Where uh, you know, I I sort of got into this stuff myself, but travel is um, sort of a part of the family though. Um, my my mum was born abroad, and uh, my my grandfather on that side was also born abroad. So the family's kind of moved around a little bit, but yeah, the the hiking and the kayaking and all the adventure sports are all sort of new territory. So they're pretty. They like seeing the photos that I send anyway. Not that they would ever want to try any of it themselves. So, so what do you think your adventurous spirit and and your your willingness to try the, all these new sports comes from? Honestly, I don't, I don't really know. Um, I think I've just always tried to, uh, just tried to see the enjoyment in whatever I'm doing. Like at school, I didn't really enjoy it that much. So I just tried to have fun as I went. I I didn't enjoy like the academic side. I mean, um, I wasn't that into hitting the books or anything. So I just kind of tried to always have fun as I was going along with those things. And I guess now that I've found a job where having fun is like the whole end result. That's what you're trying to achieve. If your group has fun for a week, then you've done your job well. If everyone's safe and having a good time, then that's great. So I don't know. I guess I've just found that I really enjoy it. And, you know, if you're doing a job that you enjoy, you you tend to do it quite well. So it's just sort of led from there. So now you, you know, you said you particularly enjoy uh, kayak touring and kayak you know ocean kayaking is is there any sports that that you tried to guide or you've given a shot um through instructing or guiding that you you really didn't like or or didn't find that connection with in some of the multi-activity centers where they have like i don't know 20 plus activities happening most of the instructors get trained in all of them so there's some that you know aren't 
aren't so fun. Uh, archery being one is pretty boring. Uh, I'd like to never do that again. <laughs> My wife loves archery. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a participant, it's all right. But as an instructor, you know, you're not, oh, gosh, you're not firing yeah. the arrows. You're trying to stop, you know, 15 children from shooting each other with the arrows, making sure everyone's pointing down the right way. And it's too much of like, you know, the fun police, like safety guide, all these different rules to follow. That's true. So that, that's kind of why it's not so fun for me. Um, uh, the actual activities, they're all pretty fun. It, it probably comes back to like the involvement of the instructor or the guide, like how much are you participating or are you just making sure no one does anything stupid? You know, you start to become too much of like a telling everyone off and I don't really like to do that so much. Just, uh, you know, telling people to behave and put that down and do this and do that. Um, yeah, you're just sort of like the fun police with some of those activities. So is there anything out there that, that you would like to try that you haven't instructed or haven't done yourself? I've been really trying to find a paragliding course or skydiving or something to do with like falling out of the sky for a little while now. No, no luck finding it? Or, or are you just still, <laughs> you, you sounded like you, I've been looking, but I haven't found anything yet. Well, I, I found a five-day course in Barcelona a few years ago that I was very tempted to go on. And by the end of it, you are qualified to just jump out of the plane by yourself. Um, but at the time, it, it, it just didn't work out. I had to go and do something else. And then I've, I found a lot of paragliding, like try this like one-day experience thing. But I really have a feeling that I would like to be the person like doing it. You know, I, I want to learn the whole process and be flying by myself that has more of a, an appeal to me than being attached to someone uh, for some reason so that's kind of the next thing i'd really like to have a go at some air sky related activities oh man I, there's a guy that we interviewed who lives not far from whistler who paraglides from mountain peak to mountain peak he actually is the first person to paraglide the length of the canadian rockies through banff and jasper national park wow this dude is i mean he landed on the peaks and had to stay there and wait out storms he he on two different peaks he had to wait over a week for weather to clear and smoke to clear isn't that crazy yeah that's um that's pretty hardcore but yeah, if he's doing lessons, maybe I'll I'll get. Okay, him yeah, I I'll have to ask him. But yeah, you should. I should definitely connect you guys because you, you're probably not that far away, honestly. I mean, relatively speaking, and great guy, and he's done. I think he went across country on one of the paragliders with the little fan in the back. Went across Canada one year, but um, yeah, pretty. That's intense, man. I'd love. To, I've never done it myself either, but would would love to. Uh, yeah, so, very cool. So let me ask. You know, you I, I know kayaking is probably coming up here in the next, you know, once summer hits, but you know, is there anything coming up for you that's kind of different and new or, or what are you looking forward to that you have planned so far? Uh, so I actually have a pretty big trip coming up this summer. Uh, myself and my friend Nuka, who's a fellow, uh, kayak guide, um, that I met two years ago guiding out here. Um, we're going to kayak from Vancouver Island to Skagway, Alaska. So a section of the inside passage. Um, and we're going to make a video series about it. So that's the next big project right now. And this winter, we've been spending a lot of time trying to build our audience and build our following, uh, try and get some sponsors interested and get some gear sorted. And then when we start, we're going to make a video series about it. So we're going to film different aspects of expedition life. So um, interesting things that we find within the inside passage and then try and raise some environmental uh topics and concerns you know like the threatened killer whales uh various uh wildlife and environmental issues and you know obviously climate change that is affecting all of those spaces so yeah we're trying to make a video series about that and yeah we've been pretty um busy trying to plan all of that stuff Holy cow. So you're doing, it looks like a big chunk of the inside passage. How, how many miles of it are you planning to do? Um, it's roughly 1,850 kilometers. So whatever that is in, in miles. Um, obviously it's a rough estimate because it's, it's not a straight line. Uh, there's all sorts of islands and different 
inlets and cool things to go and see. I'm, I'm kind of going into it of the idea that I want to sort of go and see everything that's worth seeing. So any little detour to see a cool waterfall or to see this or that, I would quite like to go and do and just really commit the whole summer to it. And, you know, we're not in a rush to get to the end or anything. We're not trying to break any records. Uh, so the, the mileage might increase uh, or it might decrease if we get bored. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, roughly 1,850 kilometers. That is awesome. That is so exciting. That is something I would love to do one day. Looks like an incredible, we've had at least two guests last year that did the inside passage fully. And uh, it was just awesome to talk about. It sounds so incredible. So I, I'm, we'll have to talk again after you do that. Yeah, um, it, it's quite funny. It's a very popular route. Uh, so, you know, considering how wild and remote it is within the sea kayaking community, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, it's uh, it's kind of like a pilgrimage that I feel uh, everyone kind of wants to do at least one time in their life. So within the community, it's fairly well known. But obviously, as someone from the UK, I got out here and heard people could kayak to Alaska. And I just thought it was absolutely mental. So we're kind of <laughs> trying to reach those people to, to show them how, you know, two fairly normal people can approach something like this. Like we're not athletes or anything. And we're not, you know, superhumans trying to smash it out in a couple of weeks. We're just going to take our time, have fun as we go. And just try and explain a little bit more about how you actually achieve something like it. You know, like we're going to film the preparation. We're going to film the planning, the day-to-day -day lives, like the camp stuff. And yeah, just kind of put some good humor into a fairly serious expedition. That'll be that'll be a good twist. A lot of people take their expeditions pretty serious. And we talk to them on the show. And it's always fun to hear somebody who's, who's lighthearted and having a good time and obviously, you know, willing to share how they did it. That's always super helpful for folks like me who are interested in one day doing it myself. That's, that's awesome. I'm, I'll be following along. Dang, I'm already. That's great. Yeah, it's I'm... called, it's called for fun's sake expedition. So we'll, we'll <laughs> try and stay true to that the best we can. That will always remind us why we're there. For fun's sake. Oh man, that's perfect. That is perfect. So can, can you just, you know, as we, as we wrap up, can, can you, can you tell people, you know, maybe just some basic advice or some principles that you use when you first started getting into this world or how you, how you led into a life that is just travel and adventure and, and getting paid to do it Any any rules or anything that you followed early on. Um, we spoke a little bit about, uh, the yes man stuff. I actually call it the yes man theory. Uh, I would yep. definitely recommend people to maybe look at their lives, uh, with a sort of a positive light, always try and see whatever problem or challenge say yes to it first even if it's just in your head and then figure out the rest afterwards a lot of people i feel particularly those that are a bit nervous about ever going traveling they're just so focused on the what ifs you know like what if this goes wrong what if i run out of money what if i get scammed and then you're so worried that you never even leave so just kind of take the positive yes i can do this yes it's going to be awesome and then Figure the rest out as you go. You'll surprise yourself. You absolutely will, man. I uh, was just telling someone not long ago, I did the first bike trip I ever did was just scary as can be, and my rack broke in like the second day. And, I, and someone gave me a couple zip ties, and those zip ties lasted for thousands of miles. A couple zip ties <laughs> just to my bike frame, and I thought, there's no way this is going to last. It ended up lasting like 4,000 miles, no issues. And I just thought, this was more useful than the actual bolt that was holding it together and you you're not going to learn that unless you're forced to and you're never going to think that that would hold the whole adventure together but it does and you figure it out as you go and, and you know what i mean there's so many things that happen you can't plan for but i totally agree with you man so many people and i i catch myself doing it with other types of things like what if what if what if and those what ifs are really one in a million yeah, so throw out your rescue kit, and all you need is zip ties and and duct tape, and you'll be fine. Dear dude, that's all you. That's all you need for anything. <laughs> <laughs> and bath tubs full of money. <laughs> yeah, you're good. That comes second. That comes second. Well, Chris, man, how how can people follow along with your journeys and uh, what you're doing? Uh, so everything I do, um, all my freelance writing and photography and whatever else. 
I do under the name Global Shenanigans. So that's on Facebook and Instagram, and I have a website as well, so you should be able to find it all fairly easy. And then the kayak trip is called For Fun's Sake Expedition, which is FFS uh, underscore expedition on Instagram, and it's on Facebook as well, and we're going to put some videos on YouTube. So we're all over the place. Uh, if you just type in either of those, I'm sure you'll you'll find us somewhere. Awesome, man. Well, well Chris, I, I mean, I encourage folks, you know, to follow him on Instagram. There's some just unbelievable pictures just from all over the world and videos. And, man, I just love, you know, you, you obviously talented photographers. So that makes it way easy to follow you. So, yeah, well, th- thank you so much for being on the Adventure Sports Podcast. And I'm, I'm looking forward to following your your for fun sake inside passage expedition it's gonna be awesome oh yeah thank you very much man it's been it's been fun first of all thank you so much for listening it means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show if you'd like to help us further you can leave a review on itunes share us with your friends your family it goes a long way to grow in the show you can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast link is in the show notes And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun.